renew all your information, uh, all your, uh, your private applicator certificate, you'll be able to do that online, considering that's only, uh, what is it, $7? Um, it, it might not be worth the credit card fee and, and convenience fee, um, but that is an option now. Uh, if you're running a little bit behind and you need to get that into us, uh, we're hoping to have that up and running um, by 2014. Uh, during the 2014-2015 license renewal time. Uh, our sensitive crop locator, um, for those of you that have been coming to these meetings for a little while, you've probably heard us talk about this for, I don't know, about three years now. Um, I have been told that hopefully within the next 10 days, couple weeks, we, we should hopefully have this up and running. Um, you know, this is a voluntary uh, program, but for those of you that have sensitive crops, uh, if you're located next to an uh, you know, ag production field, uh, you can go online, uh, register that crop. Um, it doesn't mean that they can't spray that field next to your crop, um, but that tool is there for, for that, the ag applicator to hopefully look at and say, oh, well, I've got this next to, the, next to me. Maybe I can adjust my, my spray schedule a little bit to uh, make sure we don't have any drift issues. Um, generally, when you enter your information, um, this field site's gonna come up, the, the owner of the site, address, zip, county, crop. Um, and there'll also be some, some uh, imagery um, that, that will be available. Uh, to utilize, um, you know, for that commercial applicator. You can also measure an area if, if you're unsure where everything, what everything is. Um, it's a, a pretty good tool that you can use to measure exactly um, distance, location, uh, the size of that that uh, field that you're you're hoping to get into that uh, into the locator. Um, our inspector regions have changed a little bit. Um, most of the folks that are on the western shore, uh, their, their, uh, their regions have stayed the same, more or less. Uh, we've, we've just mixed it up a little bit here on the eastern shore uh, with PD Council covering most of the uh, mid and upper shore and uh, Dorchester County. And um, Ellis Tinsley, one of our supervising inspectors, will be covering the lower shore. And uh, Scott Rouse, just up in Cecil County. Uh, legislative update, uh, we have not submitted any bills, um, but, but we are looking at two bills that will affect uh, my section, um, Senate Bill 675. Um, this is about the third time this has been introduced now. A couple years ago and, and the year before that, last year they took a break, um, but it is, it is back, uh, it has been introduced. Uh, not quite sure, it hasn't gone to hearing yet, we're not quite sure when it is, uh, but it will, will be going to hearing at some point here shortly. Um, we do a voluntary reporting now. Um, matter of fact, our, 2000, our survey for the 2011 year um, should be coming out within the next few months. Um, this bill would require mandatory reporting um, of any pesticides you've used, you've released, sold or purchased. So um, this isn't just you need to submit your records when we ask. You will need to submit your records every year on one specific date. Not only will you need to submit your records of what you applied, you will need to let us know what you have purchased. And if you've sold any, you need to re report what you've sold. Um, all our restricted use pesticide dealers will also have to uh, uh, purchase or uh, report everything that they have sold. Um, the bill will establish a special fund for the program, so it's not fee-wise, it won't affect you um, directly, anyway. Um, what it will do is it, it will, um, the manufacturers uh, pay to register their products for use in the state of Maryland. Uh, and the bill is, is tacking on some additional fees 
that the manufacturers will have to pay to, um, to register those products. Um, Who's pushing Senate Bill 665? Is that MDA? No. no. Oh, it's, um, don't, don't, if, it, I, I believe it was, it was, it was put in by Senator Montgomery, or, um, yeah, or Senator Montgomery, but, but, um, <laughs> um, it, it's, 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 special interest groups have been pushing this for the last several years. Um, there is a, there is a confidentiality clause. No one's supposed to see these records that you submit to us except for us. And, um, we can release those to researchers. Um, there is a $10,000 penalty if it is leaked. Um, so there is, there is a um, penalty, um, civil penalty if, if confidentiality is, is broken. Um, there's also pretty hefty civil penalties uh, for failure to report. So if you like the bill, great. If you don't, contact your senator and let them know about it. Um, MDA, I don't know if I can say this or not. MDA has been told not to take a position on it. So we can't, just, just, just to let you know. So if, if, if you would like to though, please contact your senators. Has Quorum Bureau taken a position on it? Oh yeah. Yeah, they're yeah. yeah they have. It's time for you guys to stand up for agriculture and our illustrious secretary. You're, you're not, not going to lose your job. This dumbass I can't run again. You're, you're not the first you're person that said, said that. Yeah, <laughs> somebody <laughs> but, resigned. Well, um, all I can say is he is a he is a cabinet official. He is not an elected official. He does what he's told to do. Well, I know that. They, that's why that, <laughs> very few of them have ever done anything. Um, it, it has been opposed by us in the past, but we've just, we, we will be writing our fiscal. It, it's going to be an expensive bill, um, and it's going to cost the department quite a bit of money and, and um, quite a bit of time. So the one thing that's going to happen is they throw the fee on these uh, pesticide <coughs> manufacturers, and, and it's going to take all the limited use materials that you can use. They're just not, if they haven't got a volume to, to have, sell this, product in Maryland, they're not going to get a state label and you can't use it. Yeah. That's and that, that's, that could potentially happen, so especially with some of those products that, <coughs> that there's not a whole lot of use, some of your specialty products anyway. Um, this this uh, Senate Bill 412 and, and 433, House Bill 433, um, won't really affect you, but this is a bill we are looking at as well. Um, this would actually prohibit the application of any pesticide, lawn care pesticide, to any licensed daycare any licensed child care provider and all K through eight schools. Um, this, this is um, in addition to our IPM regulations in school regulations that we already have, um, but that's, um, it will allow for emergency application. And again, this is just, just this will affect the lawn care industry, but, um, um, and it affects us, obviously. We have 12,000 li licensed daycare providers in the state of Maryland. I've got five inspectors. Six inspectors. So, yes. The vax, uh, due to Hopkins, Hopkins, and they're in, I'm not a big Hopkins fan. In their intimate wisdom, they have blamed all the. We have a lot of children. One in four is learning disabled. I work with children who have autism. They have put uh, the pesticides to cause autism. Autism. I have a child who uh, is actually mercury poisoning. It's a mercury preservative with shots. It's called thimerosal. Uh, and boys can't eliminate it. But in order to get that, because they're in vaccine research, that, and they've been in vaccine business, uh, they have pushed it off on pesticides. And I've done chelation on my son for four years of chelation. It wasn't pesticides or the chemicals, ag chemicals coming out of it was basically lead in. Mercury was the, the big one, and, and the, that's not in the chemical, in these things. You know, so they want to say, oh, it's the lawn chemicals. It's not the lawn chemicals that are refined with these children. That's why this bill is coming up, because Baltimore's really pushing, you know, and saying now we have a label, now we passed a law, so look in the direction of the, you know, and even with ag chemicals. And then this would just be lawn care. So 
I guess you can treat your home and around your home, but just not the grass. Um, back to this bill too, though. This this would provide. Um, and again, if you like it, great. If you don't, please contact your senators. Um, you know, this this is uh, would require us to keep records on a USDA 12-digit HUC code, um, which is basically. In the realm of things, it's only about 30,000 acres, so it's a very small area. And um, although there are no provisions to exclude homeowners, I, 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 I can't imagine we're going to go after the 1.1 million acres of managed turf grass, and um, you know, not all that managed turf grass is managed by licensed companies. So. Um, EPA, uh, there's been some new restrictions on chlorpyrifos came out last year. Um, there are uh, going to be reductions in application rates, uh, buffers around sensitive areas, uh, and again, generally, it's, it's, a lot of this came out of California. I think there was a problem with uh, one of the applic aerial applications out there that involved, involved some chlorpyrifos and Lorsban. And, uh, this is to protect the kid, children and the other bystanders who, who live near these application sites. Um, again, the, the label started changing late last year. Um, aerial applications are going from six pounds down to two, and buffer, buffer zones are going to be established around these sensitive areas based on droplet size, application rate, and, and the way you're making that application. Um, so if you're using chlorpyrifos, if, if you all are using Lorsban at all, um, generally, those buffer zones, depending on, on the rate and the type of nozzle you have, um, can be anywhere from 10 feet up to 100 feet. Um, so in some instances, it could take a field right out as far as using chlorpyrifos. Um, EPA has uh, specifically defined sensitive sites. Um, Generally, those areas that are frequented by non-occupational bystanders, so school grounds, athletic fields, um, occupied structures, and um, farm, your, your farm stead would not be included in that. Um, soil fumigation, the, the new training requirements have, have been out for a little while. Uh, EPA does have, they, <coughs> At, bless you. Out of all the, all, all the times I've been on their website, uh, they do have a, a soil fumigation toolbox. Um, and again, out of all the times I visited their website, this toolbox is actually a pretty decent tool um, that they came up with. Uh, all your information if, for any fumigation needs are, are in there. Um, but basically, the training, um, EPA is requiring the registrants to uh, develop and implement some sort of training program. Um, for certified applicators uh, that are supervising these applications. And it's got to be completed every three years. We don't have a lot of fumigation going on in Maryland. Uh, so we have just adopted, uh, instead of coming up with our own regs, we've just adopted EPA's approved uh, registrant training <coughs> programs to satisfy that label requirement. Um, there are two required parts of the program. Uh, it's a general fumigation requirement and then, and then the active ingredient requirements. Um, once you complete that training, uh, and again, it's right there, www.fumigantraining.com. It's a web-based training. Once you complete that, uh, you can print that certificate. Um, Azenphosmethyl uh, use updates have been extended. Uh, so, um, anybody, you know, apples, blueberries, uh, sweet and tart cherries, parsley and pears, um, you will actually um, be able to use those stocks through September 30th, 2013. Uh, web distributed labeling, um, I think EPA, it looks like they're going to be going ahead with this. Uh, we've talked about this at recertification meetings for the last year or two. And uh, what this is, uh, basically those, these labels, when you purchase, when you purchase your pesticides now, you, you've got that product label that's however thick it is these days. Um, you'll have a basic, very basic label on that container. Um, 
And what you will have to do is you will have to visit the website that you're directed to on that container and you can download the product label, crop specific product label. So instead of going through a 100 page label, you'll be able to download a, a one or two page document with, with your specific crop on it. Uh, and that you would keep that as your label. <clears throat> EPA is also considering defining under the supervision of a certified applicator. Uh, they want to define the levels and requirements. Uh, they're talking about uh, doing a uh, minimum age requirement for individuals applying pesticides under supervision. Um, we have minimum age requirements for our, our commercial applicators right now. Um, whether EPA is, is, is going to go a little higher than, you know, a little more stricter than what we've got, I don't know. Um, but they are also uh, talking about establish, establishing requirements for training and um, record keeping for those applicators. Pesticide storage, um, we've had storage requirements since October of 93. Um, this has come, we, we were asked actually by the uh, University's uh, Pesticide Extension uh, Pesticide Specialist, Dr. Amy Brown, if we talk a little about pesticide storage requirements. We've been seeing some issues out there during our um, disposal programs. Um, but generally, your, your storage must be secured or locked. Um, I don't know how many of you have actually seen one of our inspectors. Nine chances out of ten, you're not going to see our inspectors unless there's a complaint against your particular operation. Um, if you do see one of our inspectors, we're not just going to stop by. We're going to give you a call, set up an appointment. When we do that, at least go out and quick lock your door on the storage. Just simple, simple lock. Um, most everywhere we go, Anytime we, we, we go, whether, whether we are on a, a private farm or if we're at a commercial business, um, the storage is always unlocked when we get there. And we always make appointments. <laughs> so we, we don't just show up. What's the difference between security and lock? What's the difference? You know, I don't know. Ed, Ed put that in there. I'll have to ask him. <laughs> I guess you can have a dog sitting right there. Or? Guard. I put, I put mine in the old chest for <clears throat> and the lid closes and seals. Mm -hmm. I mean, in my opinion, that's secure. Not if it's locked. If it's if it's not unlocked, it is. It's secure. Cool. It's secure. Nobody can get to it unless they start opening stuff up. But they can get to it. They can break, break a lock. Well, you just. I mean, they you just said it wasn't locked. It's not. But they can cut a lock, so it's not yeah. secure. Enough. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Uh, I mean, it's got to be locked and secure. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, or. it's <laughs> well, or but but if I can walk onto your farm at any given time and 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 just open that up and grab it, it's not secure. So you want to have a test at eight in the evening and come on unannounced? Because <laughs> <laughs> I'll shoot anybody that comes on there. Their locks are only for honest sure. people. But um. Okay. I'm not going to argue secure or locked. That's up to our assistant AG. <laughs> um, I know you're the messenger, and we understand. Well, I'll show you. Actually, I'll show you a picture okay. from my storage area. So I'm, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm humble about. It. <laughs> uh, it should be stored in a separate building, away from food, feed, or fertilizer, or, or separated. So I mean, it doesn't necessarily be in a separate building, but as long as it's separated from from any food, feed, or fertilizer. And I'll be honest, I always store my fertilizer with my pesticides. I always have. I don't anymore, but... Um, should have a warning sign. If you don't, call the office, ask for me, and I'll send you one. Ventilated, uh, passive ventilation is fine. You got a window, oh, you know, that, that's fine. That's my storage area at one point in time. A little bit of everything, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And, and that's a lot of storage areas. I've, I've actually seen that. 
Um, this was actually taken when I was employed. Um, I live in Kent County. I was employed on a farm up in Kent County. That was my storage area. I had an inspector come do an inspection, um, worker protection inspection, and boom, that's the first place he went. So, <laughs> um, should be kept clean, best you can. Um, throw some kitty litter out there, a little bag of kitty litter, uh, just in case you have a spill. This is a tough one. Um, everybody's got unlabeled containers somewhere. You have no idea what's been in it. For all you know, it's been sitting in that back corner <coughs> for the last 30 years. Um, if you don't know what it is, just put unknown on there, set it on the corner, give me a call. I'll, I'll, I'll put you in our next disposal program. I don't need to know what it is. I don't care. As long as, as, long as the, the flashpoint meets the disposal requirements, I'll take it and get it out of there for you. Um, if they're leaked, if, if they're leaking or, or if your bags are torn, um, try to get that cleaned up and, and uh, put into another container. We don't see this as much anymore. Uh, I'll be honest, we, we, do, we do see some of this in our commercial establishments, our licensed businesses. The little iced tea bottles that, uh, a little bit of 2,4-D in there, which I don't know, that looks a little bit like iced tea to me, but mm. <laughs> it's, um, but uh, that's a little bit of Princep and a gallon jug of milk, which from mm. here looks like milk. So um, if this is a temporary storage situation, fine, uh, but try to get it into another container um, as soon as you can. A fire extinguisher. And um, oh, this this is another another one of the uh, regs. One, one of our inspectors got in an argument with with one of our commercial guys. He had a fire extinguisher, but it was inside a locked storage room. So it's locked. It's inside. You can't get to it. But the regs say have a fire extinguisher. So he technically was was in, in compliance. But but have one of these sitting around, uh, preferably one that that has been tested and will work. Um, 50 feet from any water or well. Um, if, if you can't, if your storage lo is located within 50 feet of, of uh, any type of water or well, then it, it does need to be stored in some sort of secondary containment. Um, that pan, that little foil pan, um, is secondary containment and that'll work just fine. Quick enforcement uh, summary, uh, 2012, we, we had a, uh, about 42 complaints total. Our complaint numbers have been going down. Um, unfortunately, our egg complaints last year went from four to four the previous year up to 12, um, which still, in the realm of things, all the applications that are done throughout the state of Maryland, uh, it's, it's pretty good. Um, you know, that, 12, 12 is pretty low. Out of the 12 ag complaints, six were on commercial ground, uh, two aerial, and four were on private applicators. All 12 were drift. Out of the ag complaints, we still have seven pending, um, three private and four commercial. Uh, we're waiting on, on uh, samples from our state chemist section. One of the aerial cases was withdrawn. Um, we were able to confirm two violations, uh, one against a private applicator, one uh, against a commercial company. And uh, this letter of caution, um, both of them received a letter of caution. Two of them were unconfirmed, but we did cite a records violation. And the, uh, the, the drift violations, the two confirmed violations were, were drift um, onto neighboring crops. Uh, one corn, one, one wheat. The commercial company actually turned himself in. They were, they were treating uh, a burn down on uh, some, they were doing a burn down um, prior to planting and 
40 mile an hour across the field with, with 40 mile an hour winds and a tanker Grimoxon 24D and it wiped out about um, 30 acres of wheat in the next, next field. Uh, there used to be a lot of rec record forms to keep track of your spray and everything. Now they're getting increasingly difficult to get. Like DuPont used to put them out, used mm -hmm. to get them at the trade show. Where can you get records that are legal to be used? Um, you know, I have some. I don't know if they're on our website, but I, I mean, if you want to. Okay, I can send them out. I can send them out to you. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, overall, on all our complaints, we took action. No action on four of them. We still have 18 pending. Again, we, all these pending cases we have, we're just waiting on, on sample results from our state chemist. Uh, we did confirm 10 violations. Uh, seven were unconfirmed, but all seven resulted in a records violation. So we did cite a secondary violation. Um, Three were sent on to US EPA, Region 3, for follow-up. There were some federal issues at, um, that uh, were sent directly to them. Um, we did issue six civil penalties uh, for a total of $8,650, and all six of those were actually on unlicensed businesses. Um, private versus commercial. Um, I think we had this in here last year. Uh, if you're a private applicator, you're, you're purchasing a restricted use product for use on your own, your own property or commodity grown on your own, your own farm, or you're going to purchase it or someone, someone, that you, um, someone who works for you can purchase it as well. Um, commercial certification, um, if, you're, if you're applying property, pesticide to a property of somebody else and you're receiving payment for that, uh, you will require commercial certification. Um, that private applicator certificate, we, we did issue some, some notices of warning this year to, well, it was about four or five different, different guys who were using, they were purchasing product for their neighbors. Um, so remember, if you're going to, our dealers keep records of purchases. And if you're going to purchase those products, um, when we do our dealer inspections, they, our inspectors do go run, run down the list. And um, the, the problem is they didn't actually purchase it for their neighbor. They just gave their neighbor their license number. And um, the neighbor went and purchased it. The neighbor was licensed at one time. It just had expired. But again, if, you, if you're going to purchase a restricted use pesticide, um, you know, it's just for your, for your own use. Um, things are changing. Labels are changing. Make sure you know what's going on out there. Um, just be aware. Um, we've, we've got some label changes that have just come down the pike. I saw it today. A um, bunch of cancellations, voluntary cancellations on uh, a lot of propiconazole products as well as chlorothalonil. Uh, 720 is... is um, being canceled, so um, just keep an eye on what's going on out there. It's it, uh, and you know when we do come on out, if we do make a call, you know, go ahead. You can you can put that sign up for all your guys. This was actually a commercial company who was playing with one of our inspectors, who doesn't have a very good sense of humor, um, and he knew it, and that's why he did it. But um, but anyway, um, if you have any questions. I'll take them now, um, or feel free to give me a call, uh, or check out our, our internet. We do have a new internet site. Can't guarantee it's any easier to navigate, um, but, um, but we are up and running with a new site. Any questions for Rob? Rob, do you see doing a, what do you call it, a turn-in program uh, anytime soon? I know you had one about a year or two ago. Yeah, we, we finished one up back in May last year. Um, there won't be one introduced this year, but I'm hoping I'm hoping to get one going again for next year. Um, it's, it's, it depends on what happens with these bills, because we actually use state chemist money to do our disposal program. Any questions?
Thanks a lot, Rob. But I can see you